Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I would like to talk to you about the EM drive. Yes, it's that uh, copper can which has been somehow making science writers get very excited and talk about flying to the moon in a few hours or to Mars in a week or so. So let's uh, rewind things a little. Let's actually talk about where the EM drive started. So originally it was invented by a guy called Roger Scheuer in 1999. And uh, the idea is that it would generate thrust purely from electricity. No reaction mass needed, which would of course be fantastic for spacecraft. It would mean that you wouldn't have to carry around that very heavy reaction mass. However, it's not so good for people that like physics because this does kind of break the laws of physics. Interestingly, another guy called Guido Feta came up with a variation on this, again, uses electrical power to generate thrust. He called his the Canny Drive, which is supposedly some reference to Hannibal crossing the Alps, but more likely it's a reference to Scotty from Star Trek, who was often heard to say, You canny change the laws of physics, Captain! It's back in the news because an academic paper on the experiment has finally passed peer review and been studied. So if you're not in academia, you may not actually know what this means. When you write up your experiment into a paper form, you will then send it to the publisher, who will then pass it out to people that are supposed to know what they're talking about, people that are experts in the field. And these people will read the paper, they will perhaps find problems with the paper, and they will send this feedback back. And then, of course, you are supposed to address these problems and then send a revised version. And eventually, either the paper gets published or it gets rejected. So having it passed through a peer review process is generally a good sign. It means that it's no longer on the fringes of crazy crank, you know, physics. However, it doesn't really mean that they've proved that things work. I mean, to start with, the people that are reviewing these papers, this is an experiment. They haven't gone out and done their own version of the experiment to verify. What they've done is they've kind of looked at what's been written up and said, well, you know, do you have a control experiment or did you test this? Did you, you know, we'd like you to cite this particular paper. It doesn't really necessarily prove that it's work. it works in any way. And I personally still believe that it's highly likely that there will, they will find a flaw. The reviewers of the paper, they looked through it and they've clearly had a lot of feedback because there was a whole section where the uh, authors of the paper try to address possible modes for operation which are possible things that were not accounted for and then provide some justification for why they were accounted for. Anyway, perhaps more on that later. Let's talk about how it's supposed to work. So it's actually called a resonant cavity electromagnetic thruster. What it is, is you have a sealed space and you inject microwaves at a specific frequency and they bounce around in all sorts of directions. And when you generally have sealed spaces, you can have the walls at just the right distance so it resonates at particular frequencies, hence the resonance. This is useful because it means that the microwaves can bounce back and forth several times and you they, they hang around longer, which is a good thing. So in the case of the EM drive, you're supposed to pump in the microwaves and somehow you feel a force in one direction. So the EM drive is different from many other resonant cavities in that the walls are not all parallel. You have a parallel front and rear wall and then it's a conical shape, a frustrum is the technical term. So it is narrower at one end than it is at the other end. And the inventor claims that this is essentially a waveguide and the narrower waveguide at one end means that the group velocity of the waves is lower and therefore the momentum is lower. So the reflection at one end is reflecting less momentum than the other end which is wider and therefore has higher group velocity and therefore higher momentum. So you should feel a thrust in one direction. That's the, that's the claim. And uh, it's not just the Eagle Works team that has built it. Three, at least three teams I've seen have built this and done experiments on it. Perhaps most high profile was a team in China led by someone called Professor Yang. They built a system and they, they ran it. They wrote up a paper on it. They claimed to have measured thrust, but later they retracted that paper after they figured out that they were getting 
uh, induced thrust, I believe, through cables. Any thrust that was left over was below the level that they would be able to measure with their apparatus. There's another team in Germany le led by a guy called Martin Tanjmar. Tanjmar? I, I probably mispronounced his name. Uh, and they claim to have seen thrust. And I've also heard somewhere that they may have retracted that claim, but I couldn't find that on the internet. So people in the comments, please, you know, citations would be good. But yeah, the, look, the one we're really talking about is the NASA team, the Eagle Works team who kind of like to do stuff out in the fringes, like warp drive. There's another thing they've looked at. So the nice thing about NASA, of course, is that it's in the business of spaceflight. It knows, it has the hardware sitting around. It's like, oh, do you mind if we use your vacuum chamber and torsion balance? You know, there, nobody else is using them right now. So the team were able to exploit this, and it was a pretty cheap thing. I mean, they literally built their EM drive in their dining room. So they took their device and put it on a torsion balance, which is a device which measures very small forces by rotation. You have it hanging from a very thin cable, and the twisting of the cable provides the spring that pushes your scales back. Torsion balances were used for the original Cavendish measurement of the constant of gravitation, I believe. Uh, so there, there's a long history of them being used to measure very, very small and weak forces. The original test campaign was carried out in an atmosphere and that led to many criticisms because of course the atmosphere could be generating convective forces and things like that. So instead uh, they eventually managed to get vacuum capable microwave generating hardware, put it inside a vacuum chamber and they, well that's what this paper is about. In this uh, current set of results they claim that they observe a small force in one direction when they turn on the device. They also say that when the power is increased, the amount of force observed increases, and flipping the device to point it in the opposite direction generates force in the opposite direction. The magnitude of this force is 1.2 micronewtons per watt. And this is important because that is significantly higher than what you would expect from photon thrust. So there is actually a real device which generates thrust purely through electricity. It's called a photon thruster. What you're really doing is you're generating light and you're shooting it out in one direction and it generates recoil in the other direction because photons, while they are massless, they carry momentum. The amount of energy required is pretty staggering. You need 300 megawatts for one newton of force. And well, the upside of Photon Rocket is that it does have the best possible specific impulse of the speed of light. You can't get any faster than that. Uh, this actually has been observed in many uh, systems. Solar sails actually make use of it. But interestingly, the Pioneer anomaly is commonly cited by EM drive advocates as an example of new physics, where the Pioneer probe was experiencing an extra force pushing it back towards the solar system, that was because of the radioisotope thermoelectric generator being on one side of the spacecraft and therefore the photons, the thermal photons coming off of the radiators were preferentially going off in one direction and producing a thrust in the other direction. So be under no illusion, the Pioneer 10 anomaly is not new physics, it is photon thrust physics which is well understood. So coming back, yes the EM drive appears to generate more thrust than this based upon the experiments. But, yeah, I'm a little skeptical because, hey, I'm a physicist. I spent a long time studying physics and I'm not about to have them change physics out from underneath me. Having dark energy come in, that really messed up my view of the universe. Look, the EM drive fundamentally has this problem with conservation of momentum. That, you know, you really don't want to break that. And the proponents, the advocates of the drive say, well, maybe it's generating thrust by coupling to the quantum vacuum. Maybe it's pushing against quantum vacuum virtual particles. That's their exact phrase. And I believe that John Baez, an expert in quantum vacuum, pretty much called this claim bull. Uh, reactional drives are just not things you want to have around. You know, there's a, a quote on atomic rockets, friends don't let friends use reactionless drives because they just break too much physics to be sane. If you have a reactionless drive that works by generating force when you put electricity into it without a recoil, then hey, you end up being able to do things like generate perpetual motion machines and nothing freaks physicists out more 
than claiming you have a perpetual motion machine or claiming that you are getting over unity out of your system. The way this works is that Newton's law says that the amount of work done by a system is equal to the force times the velocity. So as the EM drive system would accelerate, the amount of energy that it is putting into the system in terms of kinetic energy would increase, but the amount of electrical energy it's generating would stay the same. So eventually it will reach some velocity where the amount of kinetic energy it's getting out is greater than the amount of electrical energy it's putting in. So you could just build a wheel with a bunch of EM drives around the outside, drive that up to the critical speed, and then it would go faster and faster and you could just tap off that energy and get free energy back. That is just something that physicists do not like. So the EM drive proponents, they say, well, maybe it generates less thrust as it goes faster. And that then runs into problems with relativity, because relativity, of course, says that velocity is measured relative to the observer. So different observers would see the EM drive at different speeds, but they would somehow measure it generating, it would somehow accelerate differently depending upon the observer. Uh, that would, of course, cause all sorts of problems with special relativity. And special relativity has been pretty well established to work pretty darn well. They've also said that, hey, maybe it's better at hovering because you're basically staying still, no change in velocity, you know, anti-gravity, that would be fantastic. But that then runs into general relativity. General relativity says if you're standing inside a closed room and you can't see outside it, and you're feeling a force of 9.8 meters per second pulling you to the ground, you cannot tell the difference between uh, that being inside a rocket accelerating at that speed or standing on the surface of a planet getting pulled down at that speed. This is like a fundamental part of the formulation of general relativity, which has been pretty well tested. So having it hover, yeah, that would again all cause issues. Hovering is the same as accelerating. So obviously I'm not convinced, but I'm prepared to wait for more data. However, the device as demonstrated, even if it does work, is still not that useful. And to be fair, they did say that they had not optimized their device for performance. They're getting 1.2 micronewtons per watt. And I believe the best numbers I've seen from a nuclear reactor in space has been 200 watts per kilogram. So that works out to about 20 meters per second of acceleration per day. This device is not going to be able to carry you to the moon in a few hours or to Mars, at least at this performance level. It works out to about seven kilometers per second per year. Ion engines are way better at this level. For a start, they're a lot lighter and they can work, you know, they work with fuel. You have to get up to like 30, 40, 50 kilometers per second of delta V and missions that are lasting five, 10 years before an EM drive becomes even slightly competitive. And there aren't, there aren't any missions with those requirements right now. So I don't see that displacing ion thrusters unless they could make it work better. And it's certainly not causing things to fly or getting you to Mars very quickly. Yeah, maybe they can optimize it. As I said, they, they literally built this in a dining room. If you look at resonant cavities, EM, you know, electromagnetic resonant cavities that are actually used in science for good science, these things are built to incredibly high tolerances. They are typically machined from a solid block of copper and the end plates are bolted on with really heavy, tight bolts so that this thing does not change shape at all because they want to get the highest quality factor out of the device. The thing that was built, I, I heard one scientist describe it as something my mother-in-law might hang off a tree to scare away wild animals. <laughs> and they think this is somehow you know, going to change the laws of physics. Look, at this stage, it is little more than a curiosity. I don't believe it's going to change the laws of physics, but obviously I'm a skeptic. The paper does have flaws as well that have been identified. For example, one of the authors claims that there are no analytical solutions for standing waves inside a frustrum of that design. And I believe that Greg Egan, science, uh, science fiction author, he presented analytical solutions for this. Uh, you know, he's not just an author, he's a mathematical physicist, so he knows his stuff.
There's other problems with the paper and you know, there'll hopefully be follow-up work. It'd be really nice to see them actually build a control device, a copper cylinder, which has, doesn't have a taper and then put that on the device, on the, the balance and see if it generates thrust. But uh, yeah, at this point, I really think the experimental error is the most likely thing. If they do fly it in space, then uh, and they do generate thrust, no one would be more pleased than me. It would not only mean that everything I'd learned was wrong, but it would actually mean that we could fly spaceships around and stuff like that. Yeah, at some point, I fully expect to see a retraction and physics going back to boring old physics with no flying cars. Then again, not having flying cars is probably a good thing, given the skills of some of the drivers around here. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.